Hello, I'm Adam Retter. As part of Declarative Amsterdam, I'd like to talk to you about compiling XQuery into the native machine code. So let's take a look at what we've been doing here at Evolve Binary. Uh, I'll just share my screen. And I think I need to turn off my video. Okay. So um, here at Evolve Binary, we've been working on um, compiling XQuery into native machine code. And um, this will become relevant later, but uh, recently I've been learning a little bit of the Rust programming language. And uh, we'll see how we get on with that later for this purpose. So what is the problem that we originally started with? And why did we um, think about compiling XQuery into native machine code? So originally, uh, Fusion DB inherited uh, its query engine from ExistDB. And unfortunately, that uh, query engine has a few problems. And um, not least of which perhaps is that um, it was implemented using a uh, parser generator called Antler, uh, specifically version two of Antler. And uh, that is now a very, very old technology, which is uh, not only end of life, but effectively unsupported. So trying to find details of the Antler two parser and uh, how you write grammar constraints in it, it is quite difficult. There's not much left online these days. Um, Antler today is at version four. Um, in the meantime, we have fixed uh, several issues with the engine and uh, made some small incremental improvements. But we feel that there are uh, some fundamental problems for us in Fusion DB that we would uh, like to see improved in the query engine. And to do that, uh, we don't think that uh, just continue with the existing query engine is sustainable. We think we need a new start. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that there's also um, a performance mismatch between this query engine that we've inherited as it operates in Java, uh, whereas the core storage of Fusion DB is in C++. Now, for you, those of you that have worked with Java and C++ before, every time you want to send data uh, across that language boundary, there's uh, some overhead involved because of something called the Java native interface that allows these two languages to talk together. So ideally, we want to eliminate that overhead. Also, the current query engine uh, operates over a DOM abstraction. Um, so it's not, it's not the X query X path data model, it's actually a full DOM abstraction, which is rather inefficient um, for the things that we, we really want to focus on in an X query engine. So, We've decided that we want a new X query engine. Um, but what is it that we really want this X query engine to do for us? So one of the things that we're particularly concerned about is error reporting. Um, unfortunately, the ExistDB query engine has a bit of a reputation for misreporting line numbers and column numbers when errors occur, and sometimes um, giving you the wrong error information. So it, it might appear to give you an error code or, or a line or a column, but it's, it's, it's not related to the problem that really happened. Um, so we think that excellent error reporting uh, has to be the case. And there are um, compilers and, and parsers out there these days that will even suggest fixes to code when they detect that there's problems. And that's something that we might like to take advantage of. The other thing, obviously, that we're very um, concerned with uh, in a modern system is performance. Um, so we want to be able to exploit modern hardware, taking advantage of things like multi-core CPUs and potentially uh, graphics processing units where we could offload uh, some of the query operations potentially to graphics cards and things like that. Okay, so what does a uh, XQuery engine typically look like internally? Um, so at a high level, uh, it consists of several parts. So there's always pretty much a parser at the front. So you present your XQuery code as either a file or a string of text. And the parser performs some lexical analysis 
and then some syntax analysis, eventually generating an AST, an abstract syntax tree. And it's from this abstract syntax tree that you can eventually do interesting things. So one of the first steps you might do is query optimization. And the query optimizer uh, in, in a database might consult the database to see if there are available indexes. And if there are indexes, perhaps it can use those indexes in your query by changing some of the expressions in your query to utilize index lookups instead of doing direct comparisons. And then once you've done your basic query optimization, you have two different approaches that you might use. Um, one is the approach that ExistDB and FusionDB take today, which is to take that abstract syntax tree and um, interpret it. So each part of the XQuery language is effectively um, interpreted by a Java program, uh, which then performs some operation for each expression in the XQuery code. And obviously some of those expressions are evaluated against the database. Now, the other approach, which is uh, what we would like to do, is we would like to take that abstract syntax tree and eventually end up with machine executable code that can be run by the processor directly rather than being interpreted. So to do that, you would take your abstract syntax tree. Uh, then from there, you have to produce IR, which is uh, an intermediate representation. So this isn't um, assembly language or machine code yet. This is a, a higher level abstraction, but we're getting closer to um, the machine itself. But this is probably, uh, in most cases, an intermediate representation is still portable uh, between architectures. So from our intermediate representation, we then pass it to a compiler. And it's the compiler that here knows how to produce um, either machine code or assembly language, which is then compiled into machine code. And then once you have your machine code binary, uh, it has to be linked with um, any, any dependencies that it needs. So these might be libraries for accessing the database, data store, or the indexes, or, or whatever you need there. And eventually, you end up with um, an executable program, basically, uh, which is, is very, there's really no difference between that and uh, any other executable program on your machine and you can run it in a very similar way. Although inside a database, of course, the database really takes control of it. Okay. So this is uh, the sort of two sort of well-trodden approaches, if we like. Okay. So what we want to do is um, create a new X query engine for FusionDB. And uh, we've looked at some of the requirements that we have so based on our anatomy, the first thing that we need to think about is the parser. So with parsers, there are lots of different options out there. Um, now, they sort of predominantly fall into three categories, which is LR or LL, and then a few other ones that uh, offer different interesting algorithms. Um, I think uh, Stephen Pemberton, for example, has talked about um, early uh, in his invisible uh, XML talks as it's a uh, uh, context-free, interesting parser. And I think Tom Hillman may have uh, gone into some detail in some of his XML talks about early as well. Um, LL is more the kind of classic top-down approach. And if you were going to um, write your own parser by hand, an LL approach is typically the way that you would go. But whichever way you go, uh, these all have different trade-offs, basically. So the algorithms themselves are, are, are better at some things than others. And then when it comes to implementing it, um, you wouldn't typically implement an LR algorithm because it's, it's table-driven. Um, and that requires uh, sort of computation during the parsing. So normally for an LR, you would use a parser generator, something like Yak uh, with Flex or something like that. Now, the advantage of this is that you don't have to write the uh, Lexa and parser yourself. You can use um, Yak or, or Flex and Yak to generate the code for you. Um, so that's quite nice. You can get going quite quickly because you don't, you don't have to really understand um, how to write a parser yourself. 
The disadvantage, of course, is that uh, these parser generators have their own grammars. They might not be uh, the grammars that are published in specifications, like um, extended Bacchus nor form. Um, instead, they, they have their own languages, and you have to learn those syntaxes. Uh, but still, it's often easier than writing a parser by hand. Another option is uh, parser combinators. Um, this is a fairly new approach and uh, is often used for implementing small domain-specific languages. Um, it's a favorite of mine, actually. I very much enjoy writing uh, parser combinator-based systems. Uh, they're very easy to construct, very fast to construct, but everything is written in the host language. So you implement these in C++ or Scala or Java or, or whatever language your parser combinator library is for. There's some disadvantages with that. If you don't have clean, separate grammar, that you can refer to. Well, the other approach, of course, is a bespoke approach where you decide to write your own uh, Lexa and parser from scratch. Um, as I mentioned, this would typically be an LL, predictive recursive descent parser. It doesn't have to be, but this is uh, probably the easiest, sort of most well-known approach. And the advantage of that is that you have complete control over everything. So you can ensure that you have really good error messages. Um, you can tune the performance um, to, to which, whatever extent you are a great systems programmer or not. Um, the disadvantage is that uh, it can be a huge amount of work depending on the language that you want to implement. We want to implement for XQuery. Uh, XQuery has quite a large grammar. It's not, not one of the largest, but it's, uh, it's by no means a small task. So, so for our new XQuery parser, um, as I mentioned, we decided to implement a recursive descent parser, uh, a bespoke one. And uh, we felt that we had to do this because our requirements drove us to a bespoke design. So we really care about the error messages and we're really interested in performance. Um, one of the other advantages that you get from bespoke design is that you can completely control the white space handling. So as well as producing an abstract syntax tree, um, where unnecessary white space is stripped away. We also have the option to produce a, contact, a concrete syntax tree where the white space is kept. Um, and you can do interesting things with this, like linting and uh, auto formatting of code and things like that, should we, should we want to. It's, it's not actually on our list at the moment. Um, so with the bespoke approach, you can also decide how much intelligence you want to put into the Lexer versus the parser. So Lexas um, usually just convert uh, strings of characters into uh, tokens that represent them. So you might uh, convert, for example, the word function into a token that says, this is a function. Um, so what we've done with our Lexas, is we've tried to make it as intelligent as possible to reduce the amount of work that has to go into the parser. So while we're analyzing the character stream up front, if we detect that we're processing um, an integer literal, for example, or a decimal literal from the XQuery spec, then we will convert it into a native data type that represents the number rather than keeping it as a string. Also, uh, we have the ability to create um, subtokens. So we don't just produce a token stream, we produce a token stream from our Alexa, which has subtokens within tokens as well. So there's a, almost a little bit of parsing going on there, uh, but it's very minor but this uh, reduces the load for our, our parser in the next step. Um, and anybody who wants to reuse our Lexa, um, you get a very intelligent system that you could potentially plug a different parser onto if you wanted to. Uh, we do hope to make this open source eventually. And we have decided to implement it in Rust. And we chose Rust because we wanted to do this at a low level. And whilst we could have done it in C++14, um, which would probably be our sort of language of choice for this work. Uh, we felt that Rust was a new interesting language that has quite a lot of uh, advantages for sort of safety guarantees and creating safe verifiable code. Um, of course, if you write it in Rust, uh, it, it doesn't mean that you can't not use it from C++. You can call Rust from C++ or C um, if you set up the APIs in the correct way. So we, we've created a piece of infrastructure software um, that we hope others will reuse when we publish it as well. Speaking of uh, implementing it in Rust, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, we have struggled with Rust 
Um, whilst we have a lot of experience of different languages between our team, uh, Rust was new to all of us. And it is different enough uh, from anything else that we've done um, that we, we did have some pain. Uh, we considered several times uh, abandoning our Rust uh, approach and rewriting it in C++. Um, the, the, the sort of crux of it really is that uh, borrowing in Rust uh, can sometimes require defining lifetimes. And, and these things are, are quite unique to Rust and um, can be quite hard to get to grips with when you start programming in Rust. But anyway, we've uh, muddled through and uh, made some good progress, I think. Okay, so this is uh, our new XQuery compiler. So once we've uh, got our parser and Lexa together that we've written in Rust, um, we actually have to go from our abstract syntax tree to produce uh, intermediate representation. And then we have to compile it somehow into machine code. Well, we cheated a little bit here. Uh, and for good reasons. So we decided instead of writing our own compiler that we would use um, a well-worn, baton-tested uh, system that's out there. So there is a system called LLVM um, and it came from the University of Illinois. It's open source under the Apache 2 license and really it's kind of a toolkit for building um, compilers. So it's, it's almost like a compiler toolkit. And what we do is from our parser, we have our abstract syntax tree. And then we have another uh, application that takes our abstract syntax tree and generates uh, intermediate representation code for LLVM. And then what LLVM does for us is everything else. Um, once we have our intermediate representation, we don't have to worry about generating native code ourselves or, or get dirty in sort of architecture specifics. So LLVM is um, becoming pretty well known now. If you have a, a Mac computer, it's actually the default uh, compiler for C, Objective-C, C++, and Swift on the Mac. Um, the front end for LLVM called Clang, CLang, is, is what provides that. And then the back end uh, churns out the binaries that you need whether you're on Mac uh, Intel or the upcoming uh, Mac ARM machines. So that's one of the nice advantages of LLVM is that um, if you create a front end for it, you can target multiple backends and you don't have to worry too much. Okay. Oh, something else I should mention perhaps is that um, we're not the first people to attempt to use LLVM for um, speeding up database queries. So there are two or three um, other NoSQL databases out there that have done some work with LLVM for accelerating their database queries. So far, um, all three of the examples that we know of, which are um, MapDB or OmniSignow, um, Cloudera, Impala for Hadoop, and uh, Postgres are all SQL-focused databases. So we think this might be um, the first time anybody's tried to do this for XQuery. Um, but we think it could be interesting for Postgres, um, for example, they saw a 20% speed up when uh, compiling their SQL queries to native machine code. Obviously, those SQL queries have to be fairly um, CPU intensive, but uh, it's, it's perhaps interesting. Okay, so this is uh, our anatomy diagram for earlier. And I've highlighted the bit that uh, LLVM does for us, really. Um, it's, it's not entirely fair to say it does it for us. Uh, we have to control LLVM and, and tell it what to do. Uh, but it certainly is taking a lot of the work away um, so that we don't have to worry about it. So really, we generate our IR code here, intermediate representation code from our abstract syntax tree. And then it goes into LLVM and out of the other end, of LLVM down here comes the executable code. Um, so one of the nice things there is that LLVM has a whole suite of uh, optimizations that it provides, which you can switch on and off depending on your needs. So we don't have to write 
um, low level code optimizations. LLVM will take care of lots of things like uh, code inlining and uh, lifting of variables and functions and things like this. Okay. So let's uh, get our hands a little bit dirty. So if we look at some very simple X crew here, this is a recursive function um, that will calculate the nth number in a Fibonacci sequence. And in this instance, I've asked it to tell me what the 33rd Fibonacci number is. And this is great. And at the moment, our XQuery engine will run this and uh, it's interpreted and it will, it will give us the result correctly. Uh, however, how would we compile this XQuery into native machine code? And what might be the advantage of doing that? So I have to admit, I chose this query uh, because it is machine uh, sort of CPU intensive and um, it's tail recursive. Um, so it's going to call itself over and over and over again. And for systems that don't support tail call elimination, uh, if you increase this 33 to maybe 100 or 200, uh, it will eventually explode the, the program stack and the application will crash. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So at the moment, uh, we have this code, it's an XQuery, and I benchmarked it on a couple of implementations. So on XSDB, it takes about six seconds. On BaseX, it takes one second. And on Saxon 10, it takes about three seconds. Now, if I rewrite this in um, Rust or C and uh, compile it to native machine code and execute it, uh, effectively the same, same code, um, it executes in under 20 milliseconds. So 20 milliseconds versus anywhere between one second and six seconds um, is quite a huge speed up. So perhaps if we could just take this X query um, and when the user tries to run it, we transparently compile it into native machine code, perhaps we could get it to execute in something like 20 milliseconds or, or thereabouts. So how might we do that? Well, the first step is that we have to put the X query through our new lexical analyzer. And our lexical analyzer produces a token stream. So this is, uh, the code on this page is the token stream. So um, this X query here, although it's only uh, 10 lines of code, actually produces, um, and this is with the white space ignored. So this is an abstract um, analysis produces 53 tokens uh, with the white space. Obviously, there's a lot more tokens involved. Um, and we can run that uh, just to show you that we're really doing this stuff. So um, this is a little bit of uh, Rust code. I've just declared my uh, query as a string in line for the time being. And uh, I'm going to say that I'm using um, XML spec 1.0. Uh, I set up some tables for my Lexa. I'm going to ignore white space. I'm going to invoke our new Lexa that we have here, Lexa2. And I'm going to iterate uh, through the Lexa result, producing the tokens. So let's run that a second. OK, and as you can see down here, it's dumped out uh, the tokens one after another. So for example, at the top of our query, we have declare, then we have function, and then we have a uh, queue name. So here we have declare function, uh, sorry, declare word. Um, because this is a word, and then we have a function word, and then we have the queue name, and uh, this goes on and on and on. You can see we have a left uh, parenthesis, which is obviously the start of this. We have a dollar sign character, uh, then we have a non colonized name. So it's pulling out uh, all the terminal symbols um, in this X query as defined by the X query specification. So back to our slides. Okay, so we have our token stream, and um, that's the output from our Lexa. Now, we have our parser, and the input to our parser is the token stream from our Lexa, and it's going to produce, um, as its output, an abstract syntax tree. Now, that abstract syntax tree is really just a bunch of um, structures in memory uh, that have relationships a tree-like relationship between uh, the various structures. So 
trying to show you uh, those structures in program output is quite hard. So instead, I've um, drawn a tree diagram here of them. So for our Fibonacci number C, uh, X query, we start with an X query module. We know that it's a main module because our parser has detected this. Um, and in the prologue, we, we come down and we have our function declaration for the local fib function. So that's our recursive function that we're going to have. We have some parameters, so our function um, takes a number, it's gonna return in a number, and we have a function body, and we have a number of expressions in our function. So uh, if the number is zero, return zero, else if, and then we have to go on to the next page. Um, down here, I should mention, this is the uh, main part of the X query that basically call, is the first function call to our local fib function. Um, and then we can carry on. And uh, this is the rest of the implementation for the local fib function. But effectively, when you get to here, we have our addition of um, the local fib function with the number minus subtract minus one and the local fib, uh, fib function with the number uh, subtract two. So uh, that's, these are the tail recursive calls uh, back to our recursive function. Um, and we can see those in our abstract syntax tree that our parser has created for us. Okay. So once we have our um, abstract syntax tree, how do we actually go from that to generating uh, intermediate representation uh, code, which we can feed into LLVM? And from there, obviously, LLVM can uh, do, do, do its business and create our executable machine code. So we have uh, an application, which is basically a uh, glorified visitor pattern that does a recursive descent over our abstract syntax tree. And for each uh, node or, or structure in our tree, it calls um, a code gen function. And that code gen uh, is responsible for generating the IR uh, for that node and its dependencies. Okay. Now actually generating the IR itself is not something that we have to do by hand. We don't need to uh, encode lots of um, strings of IR into our um, visitor, luckily. Instead, um, LLVM provides a builder API, which is very easy to use. And um, as it turns out, because of this, really, I think, generating uh, the intermediate representation is a much easier task than um, actually writing the Lexa was or, or writing the parser. Now, um, we're, we're working from Rust, um, and there are various Rust bindings for LLVM. We're um, using inkwells at the moment. And um, for the experimental stuff that we're doing, it's, it's working quite well. It's uh, not perfect, but uh, it, it, it's quite good. Um, now, I think I mentioned that LLVM offers lots of um, optimizations that you can choose to switch on. So once you've built your um, intermediate representation with LLVM, you can then ask LLVM to do a round of optimizations um, over the intermediate representation, where it rewrites the IR into a new IR. Um, based on the optimization rules that you've set. Now, a couple of the things that are interesting for us anyway, as Ace Query developers, is that uh, one of the optimizations is tail call elimination. So if you recall, our um, Fibonacci function in Ace Query is tail recursive. And without tail call elimination, if the stack of recursive calls becomes too much, it will blow up the program's um, stack. So to avoid that, um, LLVM can uh, unroll basically our recursive function um, into a large loop uh, internally, I think is how it works. And it means that uh, we can have as, as much depth as recursion as we like in X query, and um, the generated IR will always run successfully regardless. Um, one of the other, uh, Optimizations that looks quite nice for XQuery is there's a lot of um, dead code argument elimination. So um, I often see quite long XQueries, uh, many thousands of lines, which have been sort of 
created a long time ago and updated over time and updated over time. And there's lots of dangling arguments and, and code in there that really should have been um, cleaned up and removed, but is effectively unused anymore. So this dead code elimination will um, just get rid of all of that dynamically for us at runtime. So we don't pay any price for um, sort of crafty old X query that has lots of things in it that aren't used anymore. Okay. So what does our uh, X query function actually look like if we were to express it in uh, IR? So um, as I said, to write the IR, you really use the builder um, that's provided by the LLVM API. However, uh, the, AR, the IR that comes at the end uh, effectively looks like this. So this is our uh, definition of our Fibonacci function. And uh, for ease um, in these slides, for our excess integer type, I've just used a 64-bit integer uh, in, in native terms. And uh, that's going to be uh, the first argument. It's called T1, effectively. The dot one means uh, T1. And uh, then we have our Fibonacci body. And uh, the first thing we do, just like in our X query, because this is the X query that's been translated into IR, is that we check to see if the argument num uh, is zero. Okay. Uh, so we set a register to the value of uh, integer comparison of I64 uh, of register one against the literal uh, number zero. And um, down here, we perform a jump to a label based on the register that we've just set. So uh, this effectively says, uh, if uh, T3 is true, uh, so if the number is zero, which we assigned up here, if, if that's true, uh, jump to uh, this label, if body one, else jump to the label, if else body one. And then we can see we, we have this label here. So this if body one is returning uh, the literal, uh, the, the constant value, sorry, zero. Um, so this is effectively the XQ code. Uh, if dollar num equals zero, then zero. So that's all of that there. Uh, and then we have the, the else. So this is basically saying else if uh, dollar num equals one, uh, jump to this part of the program, return one. So uh, if dollar num equals one, then one. Else, uh, we jump in here, which is um, basically where we perform the two recursive function calls. So this is the first call. Uh, which takes the value um, minus one. And then this is the second call, which takes the value minus two. And um, we then return the result of uh, making that call. So while this code isn't as succinct as the X query, um, this is an intermediate representation that can be compiled into native machine code that truly represents um, the original X query code that we had. So that's kind of neat, really. Um, we still have uh, a bit more to kind of do um, before we can execute this. We have to set up um, native code that effectively calls this function. But uh, for succinctness in this slide, I just wanted to show the function body because that's, that's the interesting part. And it does actually show how to call a function. So it would just be more of this really to call this function. Okay. So where are we at today? Uh, we're still quite early stage with this uh, native compilation, but um, we think we are starting to prove that it's, it's interesting. So our lexer is working, our, our parser is working. Um, now, of course, if we decide we don't want to do native compilation, the lexer and the parser are still completely valid. They're just generating token streams and abstract syntax tree. Uh, from there, we have some very experimental um, intermediate representation generation and uh, just in time comp compilation. So we generate the IR with the LLVM builder and then we ask LLVM to compile it and execute it.
So we still have quite a lot of work to do before we have uh, a new X query engine. Of course, we have to go and re-implement the X query standard library, the functions and operators. Um, but it's been very interesting. And thinking about the future, um, LLVM has some interesting properties. So for example, one of its targets is WebAssembly. So anything that you can compile with LLVM, like C, C++, Rust, or maybe even XQuery, uh, you could target WebAssembly, which maybe that means that we could then run or call XQuery from web browsers and Node.js. Uh, also one of the targets for LLVM is the GPU, so the graphics processing unit which is still um, somewhat untapped for databases. The only database that I'm aware of that uses it is OmniSci MapD. And there's a very interesting article online called um, The Billion Taxi Rides with MapD, which is worth, worth reading about if you want to see how they used LLVM to um, optimize their SQL uh, processor to process billions of taxi rides. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes my talk. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Thanks.